Francesca and Paula, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. So excited to talk to you about your experience and knowledge of marine science, seaweed, sargasm, all these things. But we wanted to start by asking about you. You know, maybe we can start with Francesca. Uh, how did you become interested in marine science? Like, is this something that you were interested in from the time you were a child? Well, I'm from originally from Switzerland, which doesn't have any ocean. So it's not really something that Swiss people get into as a career or, or can think about it as a career, as a child. But uh, my dad and I learned diving when I was 12 on vacation and have gone diving after um, almost every year with the family. And seeing these coral reefs, those tropical coral reefs, I just knew this was the most fascinating ecosystem on our planet to me. And that kind of sparked my interest in, hey, maybe I can do this as a job and spend a lot of time on the water while doing work. Yeah, that first time in like a tropical coral reef, where is one place that stands out to you when you were a child diving with your family that was just like the most amazing? Um, as a child, I think one of the really nice places we went diving was in the Red Sea. We went somewhere in Egypt that was a little bit off the beaten track and there was this place where we could go for snorkels for two or three hours and still not have seen the whole house reef and that was just amazing to me like just um, looking at turtles seeing the little clownfish in their homes and just I, I would actually put on my neoprene my shorty neoprene just so I could snorkel longer and not get cold um, so me and my dad would spend hours snorkeling there. Francesca, this is something we have in common. The first time I ever got into like a tropical coral reef was also in the Red Sea down by Sharm el Sheikh and Ras Mohammed in Egypt. I, it was, I never saw anything like this before. You know, I wasn't from a tropical place either. It's just the, the amount of the colors and the, it was just amazing to me as well. So something you and I have in common there. Paola, what about with you? I mean, how did you get interested in marine science? Yeah, uh, comparing with what with what uh, Francisca says, I'm from a small country, Honduras. Go to the beach, uh, to the ocean is really accessible. It's a tropical country, and you can just go to the five islands in the Caribbean of Honduras, and are really near from there. My family likes, loves to travel, and that's one of the reasons also. At the same time, I was Girl Scout, <laughs> and we make a, a lot of like travels uh, into the mountains uh, and also outside in the in the ocean. So when I remember when I saw it for the first time, it was really really amazing. And also the stories that my mom told. She lives like 11 years in the Caribbean, and I just <laughs> fell the love for for the ocean. <laughs> So it sounds like you were really interested in nature and the outdoors being a Girl Scout, but then especially uh, exploring some of these warm tropical areas. Your mom spent time in the Caribbean. It sounds like you really got interested in, in um, maybe marine biology, marine science in, in these uh, warm water areas. Yes. At the beginning, I was more interested in like, the terrestrial biodiversity in islands. That was really different because I started working with mushrooms. But I also start working with mushrooms in islands because I always wanted to be close to that kind of ecosystems. Yeah, really interesting from both of you. You know, you have different backgrounds, but then they kind of came together with, with similar work you're doing. And let's talk about that a little bit. Can you please tell me a little bit about your current professional life? Like, where do you live and what kind of work projects do you work on? Yeah, currently I live in Quintana Roo in Mexico on the Caribbean coast and I work for a startup called Seafields and the goal of Seafields is to have really, really big aqua farms of sargassum to use it for carbon sequestration. So sargassum has a lot of carbon in its um, um, biomass, so it takes up CO2 when it does photosynthesis and we want to use this to draw carbon from the atmosphere down and sink the sargassum to the deep sea and lock the carbon up there or in there at the bottom of the sea. Um, but to get there, there's a lot of things that still need to be researched. So at the moment, we are mostly in the research and development phase and 
me as a scientist, that's a really interesting phase to be in because we get to, I get to work with engineering problems, but also biological problems such as how do we contain the sargassum in the open ocean? Does it still keep growing if we contain it? What happens if we sink sargassum to the deep sea? Does that affect the deep sea? Is it safe to do so? Or does it have more negative effects than if we let climate change rampage the world? So there's a lot of things we have to research about this, but it is really, really exciting to me because I'm very interested in helping out to, to lessen climate change because it is uh, probably the most important problem we have to solve in this decade. And, and we really need to do something about it. And being an expert of sargassum and using this to help with this is, is a really great opportunity to me. Francisca, it sounds like it's a very complex problem, but one that could potentially be very beneficial if we can figure out how to do this, you know, in the most efficient way, optimal way and, and safe way as well. Very interesting work you're doing. Paola, what about you? You know, where are you living? What kind of projects are you working on? Uh, now, I'm currently a student of a master's degree program in Costa Rica. <laughs> it's in, in integral management of tropical coastal areas. So now I'm currently a student in special variability of stabilized autopsic algae and, and parafishes. And the, <clears throat> the aim of this study is to start uh, understanding more about these uh, fisheries and also to gave recommendation for the managing of the compressor-based diving fishery. Uh, and at the same time, I'm an assistant in CIMAR, that is the cen Center of Research in Marine Science in Costa Rica. And also I'm involved with the sargassum um, topic that they are working now here because the arrival of sargassum in Central America is relatively new. Uh, we have the <clears throat> most of the data from 2019 in difference from Mexico, for example, you have arrivals, I think, since 2011. So this is currently, this is very new for us here in Central America. So now I'm getting involved with this project too. Okay, so let's talk specifically about these different species of sargasm. From what I understand, there are a lot of different species out there. Which are those varieties of sargasm that really have negative impacts on people and ecosystems in the coastal environment? Yes, um, so there's 350 plus species of sargassum, and there's only two of them which are actually always floating. Um, sargassum fluitans and natans, but those are the ones people normally refer to when they talk about this sargassum problem, because those are the ones who, who make these really big mats, who are making these problems in the Caribbean Sea, but also in West Africa. Um, but there are, as Paola said, also these benthic species that also sometimes wash up on the beach. And there are benthic species which make problems in, um, in California, in the UK, and I think also in the China Sea, um, competing with other algae that people find more useful or that are more useful for the ecosystem. What are some of the major impacts on the ecosystem? I mean, like, especially I'm thinking of, uh, like, let's start with these large floating mats. If there's a large floating mat of sargasm, how does that change the ecosystem around it? Well, if it is out in the ocean, it's actually really, really positive. So the large floating mat of sargassum, anything that is floating on top of the ocean, whether it's um, plastics or wood or algae, it attracts fish. It is a place for fish to have some shade, to congregate, where there's like little things to eat, where there's algae, little um, animals to eat. So sargassum congregates even more fish because it is this specific floating ecosystem. And it also has a lot of um, endemic fish in there and other like crabs and so on. So there's a lot of animals that live in the sargassum that are completely camouflaged to live in the sargassum. And then you have the big fish that we like to fish and to hunt that also get to the sargassum. And even dolphins go there and play with the sargassum. So it's a really awesome ecosystem 
the baby turtles live in it for several years when they're out in the open sea. So it's called the rainforest of the sea sometimes, these floating mats in the Sargasso Sea. When they come to the beach and there is, you know, knee deep, hip deep sargassum on the beach, it's rotting, um, it's releasing brown water into the ocean, it may be stocking up in the bay because it can't all get on the beach. That's when we have real problems because then the ocean has very little or no oxygen anymore. So nothing can live in there. If a turtle or a fish gets trapped in there, they die. Um, the seagrasses die, the mangroves die, coral reefs close by can be impacted. So um, the the turtles who want to go lay ne um, their eggs may not be able to pass. And the little turtles who, if, they, if their mom was able to pass, they will maybe not be able to pass going to the sea. So there's a lot of problems for coastal ecosystems if a lot of sargassum is um, getting to the shore. So like a lot of sargassum in a shallow inlet or bay, it's going to like take in a lot of the oxygen and make an, an oxygen free and uh, an environment without oxygen. So then that really affects how different marine animals, if they can even survive there is what you're saying, right? We talked to people from Curacao where they have the problem of um, sargassum getting trapped in these bays and they have to rescue turtles from the bays because these turtles would die otherwise staying in there. And then they actually have to keep them in the sea aquarium for several months because the turtle knows that bay as its feeding ground where it can find seagrass. So it would go straight back into that bay, even though the bay is not a good place for it to stay right now. Wow, that's really interesting. So sargasm can create a dangerous environment for many of these coastal animals and they could find themselves in a, in a dangerous situation. It sounds like there's some intervention or interaction that people can have to maybe help save some of these animals. What, what about the impacts on people? I mean, so we talked about a lot of this sargasm washing up on shore. I mean, wh what kind of impact can that have in the coastal environment if you get a large, say, mat of, of the floating sargasm coming into shore? How does that affect the economy? How does that affect tourism, fishing? I mean, what are some of the biggest impacts that we see on the people that live on the coast? For example, here in Central America, we don't have like a study yet uh, to know how are the real impacts. We are trying to document that with the university. But uh, something that is really important, and Frank, Francisca mentioned it, is that I think sarcasm is not the problem. The algae is not the problem. The problem is the quantity that is arriving. Because some people can see it as a benefit. As I told you, some fishers say that they, they see sarcasm as a place in the past. But obviously, now that it's arriving, um, they see it as a problem for all the impacts that they see. We don't know the importance in a formal way, but the fisher told us what, are, what they see, right? Like dead animals and also for the tourism, uh, obviously the people don't like the smell, don't like to be there. They People don't know if they can swim on the beach. So they start affecting the hotels, the restaurants that are in the area. Uh, I think uh, Francisca can talk more about the impacts because she's more related in that uh, in the area. There are more information about that. Before we go to Francisca Paola, it sounds like you're saying maybe in some cases a little bit of sargasm can be a good thing. Like, f for example, for fishermen out there, but maybe it's just the quantity when you get a really big quantity coming in, that can be more of the problem. Yes, exactly. As as my advisor says, uh, sarcasm is just like the reflection of a disease that is happening in, 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 the, in our oceans, right? Uh, in low quantities, uh, I understand that sargassum brings nutrients, bring life, and also can help to avoid erosion up from the beaches. But the problem is the quantity that is arriving to these areas. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And that, that's consistent with what I've heard in other places. Francesca, anything you want to add about the impacts of especially the floating sargasm on people that live on the coast? Yeah, so when it arrives in high quantities, 
Um, as Paola said, it affects the fishermen. They maybe can't go out with their boats. Um, it affects tourism, but it also affects the health of the local people. And this is often not talked about, but it's a really important impact. So when it decays, it releases hydrogen sulfide and other gases, which are really bad for and give health impacts immediately, but also chronic health impacts. Um, and these are still being studied, especially the chronic ones, but people can get dizzy from it, they can get a headache, they feel uneasy, and this affects people who live close to the shore. So some people have these high amounts of hydrogen sulfides in their houses. They cannot sleep at night because of how it affects them. The school children who cannot um, concentrate on school and have to actually be let out or go to the sick room um, because they're not feeling well. So the whole school day is interrupted by the kids being uneasy about the sargassum too. So, you know, uh, this, is, this is not just an impact, not only an impact for people in the water. This also can be people that are on land because it sounds like this will actually um, spread, uh, change the chemistry of the, the air near the coast. Yeah, very interesting. Um, what about, we've talked about the quantity. Is the amount of sargasm increasing in the, say, Western Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico? I mean, do we see more sargasm now than we did maybe 20, 30 years ago? Yes, so there was this event that happened in 2009, 2010, when before that the sargassum was mostly in the Sargasso Sea, which is a a sea without any land border uh, around Bermuda, um, so in the northern Atlantic. And as Paola said, um, the Caribbean would get some sargassum on the shore, but not much. And it was mostly seen as a positive thing where you can fish um, near the sargassum patches and where the sargassum would help with um, beach erosion. But then in, in the winter of 2009, 2010, the currents around the Sargasso Sea that keep it in um, were really weak for several months. So this was the weakest we've ever recorded this current for the longest time. So it's likely um, due to climate change that this happened. But during this, enough sargassum could escape and travel um, towards the east to the nor North um, African coast and then travel down with the currents there and end up in the tropical Atlantic where you have upwelling, so a lot of nutrients coming up and you have a strong sun, so the sargassum had this really, really good growing condition and started growing big. And then towards spring, summer, it gets pushed um, towards the Caribbean, going past the outflow of the Amazon and the Orinoco River. Again, more nutrients. And this is where we started in 2011, see these really big events. And almost every year since 2011, the Caribbean and West Africa have seen really big sargassum events. 2013 was a bit of a low year and some, some places haven't seen sargassum in some years because maybe the currents weren't going there. But um, since 2011, we have had a lot more sargassum in these areas. Um, some years are bigger, some years are less within that period. Um, so we cannot say that it is increasing every year since then, but um, the last few years were definitely some of the biggest ones. In general, is most of the sargasm coming up from South America or is it just kind of coming in from the open Atlantic through the Caribbean? I mean, where is it originally coming from? So yes, it, the sargasm that we get now, it's this entire belt that spans from West Africa pretty much to Mexico. And it has this, this yearly pattern of where it is located due to where, how the currents move. So um, in summer, it makes this really big belt. And in winter, kind of most of the sargassum is congregated in the middle of the Atlantic and is growing there. And then when the currents push it again to the sides, it will go past um, the coast of Brazil into the Caribbean and, and also go from the middle of the Atlantic towards West Australia. So it sounds like it really travels with these currents so maybe understanding the oceanography and the currents can help you understand where the sargasm is going to go yeah and that's exactly what is happening here in central america the 
uh, there's a student that are trying to understand what about oceanographic uh, dynamics because we saw sargasso until 2019 that are our first reports in Central America, a massive, massive arrivals of sargasso. So it's really interesting that we are <clears throat> receiving sargasso now and also we can see a difference, for example, from Honduras uh, to Honduras from here, Costa Rica. Uh, so we have data from some months in Honduras and other months here in Costa Rica. And also we see until the data, the data that we have now, we see difference along the years that there are years that are arriving more in Honduras or there are years that are arriving more here in uh, Costa Rica. And it's really interesting because this year for Honduras, I think that because now not much people are talking about this area, but this year we have a lot of reports from Honduras in a massive way. So it's really important to understand more, more about the oceanographic dynamics to understand more about these events. As we're seeing these big events affect the Central America, are, are people are there are more resources to study it and to learn more about it. Uh, do we find more students, for example, studying sargasm? Until now, no. Uh, they are trying to organize uh, the government and all the NGOs and other governmental institutions are starting to organize like uh, a, like work groups, like commission. For example, here in Costa Rica, <clears throat> I think that they are having a good start because until now, there's a commission of sargassum from Costa Rica and the universities involved, the association of fishers, uh, people for tourism, people from government. And so the idea with, which, with what we are working here in Costa Rica is trying to uh, incentivate other people from Central America to start doing this and to start uh, <clears throat> trying to, sorry, to and encourage students to start studies with this because until now uh, we are just documenting. I think it's really important to document where is uh, arriving sargassum and uh, the level of, the, of these arrivals. But there's a lot of missing information from this area now. Sure. Uh, sargassum can cover an enormous, uh, huge amount of area. How do we even track that? Like, how do we know where it is and where it's going? What's the science behind the tracking of sargasm? So um, there's different um, entities or different organizations that take sa satellite images. So you can see sargasm on satellite images. And um, so when it is not a cloudy day, they take a daily or even sometimes multiple times a day a picture. And then from that picture, they you first of all see, oh, it's getting close to my area. But they also then use the, the models of the currents, so the currents that are predicted for the next few days, to model where that sargassum is going to go in the next few days. So those are the models that help you predict for the, you know, what's happening this week. And then we also have a group that looks at the sargassum month by month and gives you like a three month lookout and also in about about in february they can say whether it's going to be a bad year or a good year like if there's going to be a lot of sargassum they can't say where it will land but they can say overall will there be a lot in this belt or not who are who are some of the main organizations that are you know doing sargassum forecasting um some of the main organizations is um the um, University of Florida, um, and then we have uh, a university in Texas called uh, wait, um, uh, Texas A&M is doing forecasting as well. And then we got Sam's tool, which is um, from from um, France. So they they have been working. It's like the the French um, space agency, which make, makes this tool. And they spent about four years creating this tool. And now we also have um, Planet, which is an organization that has a lot of satellites. Um, they also started working on sargassum um, prediction. 
Yeah, that's great. It's such a big problem that I could see many of these organizations working together can kind of maybe help us track this and, and predict it. Also to complement uh, this monitoring, people are working in more scientific uh, community science actions. Uh, for example, we are working with some application from phones and fishers and people from the community are helping to monitoring sargassum, the arrival, taking photos. And with that, that tool is really important because sometimes for the resolution, for example, of satellite, satellite matches, uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> there are like small quantities that are really important in some areas. So for that reason, uh, they start like working more in this uh, in this action with the with the communities to start monitoring, uh, and that's why we are doing here in in Central America. Also, we want to start more with satellite images. I see. So um, it sounds like satellites have been important, but also maybe some of these images on the ground of what people are seeing in these coastal locations also can help us kind of know um, it, certain impacts in different beaches. Um, that, that's very interesting. Thank you to both of you. I wanted to uh, finally ask you a little bit about the podcast. I know there is a Sargasm podcast that you and some of your colleagues are involved with. Could you share a little bit about what that podcast is about, how people can find it, and also the history, like how long has this podcast existed? Uh, yes, so um, the Sargasm podcast has been around now for a year and a half. We've um, published 51 episodes, each of them interviewing one or two people about their sargassum story. And we really try to have a diversity of stakeholders we talk to. So we are talking to entrepreneurs who have come up with successful products. And we hope that it inspires people on, on other islands to also come up with products and see how, you know, how the how they came there, like how they became, went from, oh, I'm interested in doing something with sargassum to actually successfully doing so. But we're also talking to people being impacted to, to highlight and amplify their stories of the impact. And we also talk to people like underwater photographers, um, to people who've been rowing across the Atlantic and just saw sargassum for the first time while doing this rowing race. like. There's all, all these crazy stories of how people relate to sargassum. And um, our goal is to, to share these stories with the world, um, especially in the regions that uh, people are impacted, so they, they can get more information about sargassum, more information about what's happening in other islands. And the podcast is in three languages. Uh, most of the episodes are in English, but we also have episodes in Spanish and in French because if one of the people we or we want to interview is mostly uh, mainly a French speaker or a Spanish speaker, we want them to t be able to tell their story in their language. And we don't only publish it on on the podcast sites like Spotify and um, Apple Podcasts and wherever, wherever you can get the podcasts, but we also publish them on YouTube and. Um, that way people can have subtitles in any language. So if you're an English speaker, you can still listen to an episode in Spanish and read the subtitles. Uh, I was invited for Frank <laughs> the first mm -hmm. time she interviewed me the, about what I, was, what I was working with Sargasso. And then she invited me to be part of the podcast. And I'm really happy with this project. So I'm more working with the Spanish interviews. And it's really amazing because as Franz says, for example, here in the area in Central America, it's important to start like hearing the story from this area in their language. So we are trying to interview fishers, fishers and people from the community, people, people from the academia. So it's, it's really important. I, I always tell Francisca that in this way, we can go into, a, into this topic and start to a, start people know about more about this this issue 
I, I was listening to a few episodes in the past week and I was amazed on the different types of topics that you're covering on this podcast. I listened to one podcast about, you know, solutions of how we can create barriers. And, you know, some of them focus on solutions. Some of them were just people's stories of how they first encountered or, you know, uh, observe sargasm. I really like that you're talking to so many different people in so many places with and the stories are, you know, a, a wide variety of different many different types of stories. I thought it was really well, well, um, well done and well produced. Yeah, like if you think about it, a podcast about a certain species or two species of algae is extremely niche. But then at the same time, because it affects literally everybody and about anything, even though you would think it is a very niche podcast. Yeah, you would think that the topic itself, maybe the if you're a biologist studying this, it's very specialized. But then the impacts, even I'm in Texas on the coast and in the year 2014, there was a major landing of sargasm here. People are still talking about that. They're very concerned and always watching where the sargasm is. So, you know, from Texas to Florida through the Caribbean, Central America, I mean, this is a very large area where people are very concerned about this topic. Last question, anything else that you would want listeners to know about sargasm or, you know, any last thoughts you have that you would, you would want to share with people about this topic? Maybe something very quick is I think sargasm is not only a topic for the academia. It's a topic that really involves like all the community, all the different actors. So now I know that working with all these different actors are really important to understand more, more about this topic, about how to uh, manage this problem. So it's really important to know more about sarcasm, not only from the people that are working in the academia. <laughs> I repeat that. It's important for all of us. Francisca, any last thoughts that you would want to share with listeners about the topic of sargasm? Listen to our podcast. Like it's such a fascinating topic with so many fascinating stories. And um, the time we had on this podcast, we were able to share a lot, but definitely not all of what's happening out there. Yeah. And like I said, it really, I was impressed by going to the podcast and seeing all these different stories of how we're monitoring this, how the, the biology behind it, the, the human impacts. It, you're covering a lot of different uh, angles, a lot of different stories. And um, I agree with what you're saying, Paola. It's just it, it's beyond academia. You know, anyone that has a tie or an interest to the coastal areas, to the Caribbean, Central America, Gulf of Mexico, this will have an impact in some way on the coastal environment and the marine environment. Francisca and Paola, really appreciate you both coming on the GeoTrek podcast. It, this was a really great opportunity to hear from you and about the exciting research that you're both doing. I'm looking forward to continuing to follow your work in the future and and i'll continue to listen to the sargasm podcast it's really great work that you're doing and i'm excited to follow it in the future thank you for the invitation <laughs>